there was one moment that I really realized how important looking at it through his eyes were because when when John first went into the hospital and that happened overnight, they were sleeping, they woke up, neither one of us was there and, and the nanny was there and, you know, sort of explained daddy's in the hospital. And when I came home that next day, I said, dad, is he's in the hospital, he's getting, you know, I explained to Cooper that daddy is in the best place he can possibly be and the best doctors and the best nurses and he's getting the best care and that's why it's important that he's at the hospital right now you're listening to the milk podcast this is the show where we talk about motherhood and sexuality with amazing women with fascinating stories to share on the joys of being a milf now here's your host the milfiest milf i know jennifer tracy Hey guys, welcome back to the show. This is MILF Podcast, the show where we talk about motherhood, entrepreneurship, sexuality, balancing everything, and then some. I'm your host, Jennifer Tracy. So glad to have you. And this week on the show, we have Kelly Hoover Greenway, who is uh, an old friend of mine from when our kids were in preschool together. And I was actually in the preschool band, the parent band with her husband, John, who's awesome. And we had such a good time. The The name of the band was The Mother Fathers. And we had such a good time. We played at the school fundraiser. I think we had another gig in Hollywood. Um, and people came to see us. And it was really fun. Um, and we were pretty good. I, I have to say, we were pretty good. Uh, so Kelly came to me she had heard of the podcast and she messaged me and said, Hey, I want to be on the show. And I was like, of course, duh, anytime you want. So we figured it out. She came over to the house and Kelly is such a babe. Like she's one of those women that you stop in your tracks when you see her walking down the street. More than that though. (laughs) And I feel like I always say this about my guests because beauty is great. Love beauty. It's amazing. Yet it isn't the thing that carries us through life and the hard times. It just isn't. Her moxie and her strength and her grace is just so apparent when you hear her talk about her husband's cancer, which she will she will talk about in the interview. And um, it was just such an honor to sit down and talk with her. And not only about, you know, most of my guests I get into balancing just like regular life with a healthy family and and work and career. But she had work, career, healthy kids, and then her husband got sick and dealing with that and and continuing on, continuing on, keeping going. Still got to raise the kids, still got to do the job, still got to, you know. So uh, spoiler alert, today John is cancer-free. Hallelujah. We get to hear from Kelly. So I really hope you enjoy this episode. Thanks so much for tuning in and enjoy the show. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Jen. Thanks so much for being here. Oh my God. You know how excited I am to be here. I invited myself. I'm so glad you invited yourself. So, I mean, gosh, there's so many things. There's so many questions I have for you because this is like kind of the first time we've hung out one-on-one. I know. It's our first date. It's our first date. I'm a little nervous. It's really exciting. You're so pretty. You look so good. You're so pretty. (laughs) Should we do this for 40 minutes? Yeah, let's just do this. (laughs) Your skin's amazing. Your teeth, your mouth. Thanks. Same. Same girl. All. All of it. Working. You're such a MILF. (laughs) See, where should we start? You are a mom of two boys. I am. You work full time. I do. And your husband had brain cancer. He did. So let's talk about that. Okay. When did that happen? It's always so hard for me to, it's a weird timeline because you you enter into this time warp where you don't really, the passing of time feels different. So a day feels like a year, feels like a month, feels like a second. So he was diagnosed uh, February of 2016 and um, completed treatments around June of last year. Wow. Yeah. And we had, um, our youngest was nine months old at the time. I had sort of really just come through some pretty heavy postpartum anxiety, depression. Had you had that with your first son? No, 
Um, which was interesting, right? Like I really, I thought I had cleared that hurdle. And even with my second, it didn't come right away. It was a few months down the road. Um, but so I had, I was just coming out of that and John started getting migraines out of the blue, you know, sort of went through the regular checks, went to urgent care. They said it might be stress, um, got his eyes checked because he had been, you know, looking at computer a lot at work. And then kind of just to check off that final box, went to a neurologist. And even the neurologist wasn't overly concerned because the migraines were the only symptom. We pushed for an MRI and he had a tumor the size of a grapefruit in the front left lobe of his brain. How old was he? 36. What was going through your head when you got that diagnosis? I assume you were in the room with him. No, I was not. I didn't go with him because we didn't think think that I needed to, right? right? And um, I was home with the boys. I had just put the boys to bed. I was lying in bed with, um, with my oldest, who was four at the time. I heard my dog barking and I knew that John was finishing up and we were going to get the results the next week. And and I heard my dog barking. So I go out to see what the asshole dog is doing now. And one of my friends, one of my best friends was standing on my front porch. And, you know, when you have like young children, no one comes by unannounced and you don't do that. Yes. So I was super, I was surprised, excited to see her. And I said, what, what are you doing here? And she said, well, I'm here to sit with you while you call John. And I knew, right? Like I knew in that moment that what had happened. And to answer your question, the thing that went through my mind was, how did this man who just found out that he had a brain tumor and was told to go immediately to the emergency room have the wherewithal to call a friend Mm. to be with me? Right? Like, it's it's uh it's him you know him yeah he's so kind he's just kind kind yeah through and through. yeah so uh and then it was just like off to the races after that we didn't really know what was going on we didn't understand the diagnosis we didn't know if he needed surgery that night we didn't i, I mean nothing so you you get a very quick education in healthcare. (laughs) How long was it before you actually were able to sleep? I remember, I mean, I spent that night in the hospital with him. And then I remember coming home the next day and and I hadn't slept. I just, because he stayed in the hospital and I just sort of passed out. Yeah. And then, you know, one of those sleeps where it's just so heavy. Yeah. And I woke up and I just, you know, I took a moment and I remember being like, this is real. And then we just went down the road. And it was a two-year road, over two years. Over two years. Yeah. So he had surgery. He had surgery about three weeks later. They did the awake surgery, which I didn't even know was a thing. But to make sure that they're not hitting, you know, the, the tumor is so close to your motor functions and cognitive, you know, so they put you under and then wake you up at a certain point during the surgery and ask questions, show flashcards and, you know, make to make sure that you're still able to speak, that you still recognize things. Um, So we did that and it was an amazing success. And the, the surgeon is, my God, she's like Wonder Woman. She's incredible. This woman at at UCLA. Wow. What's her name? Dr. Linda Liao. Yeah, it is. That's just sexy when you say it. She sounds incredible. Yeah. She's a badass and also a mom. Um, So you should get her on the podcast. I will. So so we did surgery. It it turned out to be grade three, which is not great, um, but certainly not the worst it could be. But that required then six weeks of daily radiation and chemo. And then he had a break for about a month, and then 13 rounds of chemo. And currently he is? His scans are clear. His scans are clear. But here's what I want to say about that, because I was having this conversation with a friend last night. The journey is not over. Yeah, I was just going to say earlier when I said it was a two-year, two-and-a-half-year 
that you were in it, but I wanted to say, and I'll say now, you're still in it. You're like still you're in never it. not, you're never not in it once this happens. You're never not in it. And I think I took that for granted with, you know, other people in my life too. And you, you, you're there for people when they're going through the experience and you support them. And we had an amazing community, um, you know, mostly mm -hmm. from our former preschool and people that supported us. And then when treatment is done and scans are clear, you sort of move on with life, right? Yeah. Uh, in your mind, like we're okay, but I have to say this part is harder. Because you're waiting for the next scan? Because you're living, you're living in between the scans. Yeah. And also, and it may be because it's specific to the brain, but he's kind of a different guy. In, in what sense? Well, you know, John's got like a very sort of sarcastic sense of humor, right? Yeah. Where his tumor, and by the way, I've said all of these things to him, so I don't feel bad <laughs> talking about it. So when he hears it again important. on this podcast, I, I he'll be okay it, with it. I think it's important, right? Like, yeah. I think honesty in these situations is super important because I know other people are going through it, too. Yes. So where his tumor was located is the part of the brain that is impulse control, it's decision-making, it's kind of the thing that separates him from being like a jovial sarcastic right to sometimes now it just gotcha yeah you know and so i think for us as a married couple we're now figuring out who are we who are you yeah with this new um you know pieces of your brain missing and recalibrating to your life and kind of re-entering life as as it was before but everything is different yeah and how do you deal with that as you know your side of the relationship where you have been on this journey with him alongside him with the children raising the children together through this and then you're faced with this person that is different than the man you married but you're still in this marriage and you still have needs and reactions to these things. How, do you, do you find yourself censoring yourself? Do you say it anyway? Like how has this sh shifted your relationship with him in terms of communicating? I mean, it's both. I, I try to, I try to always be cognizant of what a miracle it is that, that I have the luxury of being annoyed with him. Mm. And at the same time, like, you know, I'm still, as you said, a, a person in this relationship with needs and um, it would be a disservice to him and to the relationship that we forged when we first came together if I just sort of gave him a pass, right? Yeah. We're navigating yeah. it all. Yeah. And how is it, how was it with your sons? I mean, you had this. My, he wasn't even a toddler yet, right. the baby. Yeah. And then you had a toddler in preschool. Yeah. Or, I mean, not that toddler, I guess. What are they called at that point? It's But now I'm starting to Assholes. forget. <laughs> <laughs> yes. How did you navigate being with them on this journey or, you know, all of the above? Telling them, not telling them, how much to tell them? Well, Griffin was so little that, you know, he... There was no telling him. I mean, we did tell him actually because we everything sort of changed, right? Like all of a sudden we have dinners coming to the house from friends every night and people coming in town and and there's no way to sort of hide it. Yeah. With Cooper, I did a lot of research on what you're supposed to say and not say and then I sort of just adapted that to the type of kid I knew I had. And he's a, a kid that wants all the information. And so we gave him the information. And I think the thing, there was one moment that I really realized how important looking at it through his eyes were. Because when, when John first went into the hospital and 
that happened overnight. They were sleeping. They woke up. Neither one of us was there. And, and the nanny was there and, you know, sort of explained daddy's in the hospital. And when I came home that next day, I said, you know, dad, is he's in the hospital. He's getting, you know, I explained to Cooper that daddy is in the best place he can possibly be and the best doctors and the best nurses and he's getting the best care. And that's why it's important that he's at the hospital right now. And then a couple of days later, John got released from the hospital because they decided not to do the surgery right away. And I immediately go to Cooper and I say, such good news, like daddy's coming home. And he got so upset and he said, why aren't they helping him anymore? Mm. You said that was the the best place for him to be. And so I realized in, in that moment, like, how children process the information yes. and how, when I said, this is where he needs to be, you know, he really, he, he believed me. Yes. And so I tried really hard to always be aware of what I said along the way and how, how does it relate to the last thing I said along the way? Um, and, and just make sure that we provided him a space to ask questions or not. Right. He didn't want to, um, we got him a therapist that was, you know, a play-based therapist that just sort of gave him a space to talk about it or not talk about it, you know, but I wanted, I wanted to do right by him and not, and not neglect his story in the experience. So I want to ask you about, so you worked before you, mm-hmm. you've always worked. I've always worked. You're in the business. Work you're a producer. Reality television. Okay. And you had your first child. You kind of went back to work pretty much right away. I think I took about five months off. Okay. With Cooper actually. Okay. Yeah. And with the second, with Griffin, you also mm-hmm. went back to work. Okay. So in the midst of this, how did that affect your work? Well, I was in between. I've, I've been freelance most of my career. So I happened to have been in between jobs when John got the diagnosis. And so for a while, I didn't, it wasn't even a thought in my head to try and go back because as you know, our schedules are crazy in this, in this industry. So, and John was in the business too, right? Shortly, I guess maybe if I don't know, maybe six months down the road, I realized that I I needed to go back to work financially. Like, answer is expensive. Yeah, and like in addition to being a real pain in the ass, like it's not cheap. So I had been a freelance producer my entire career, but had always really been interested in development. And um, a friend of mine, great single guy, if you have. Um, single girlfriends. He's a keeper. He was the head of development at a production company. And he and I had worked together years and years before. And he took a chance, gave me a position that I was not really qualified for. And it, it changed the trajectory of my career because I realized that I actually loved development. And I had always been afraid of being Uh, you know, on staff somewhere and having to go to the same place every day and see the same people every day and like drink the same coffee every day. (laughs) I mean, it just sounded so horrifying to me and, and boring. You mean that too? Okay. And, (laughs) and like, I just, I love what I loved about production when I did it was every few months you're with a new group of people, you're in a new location, you're learning about a different topic. Like, it's nuts, but it's always an adventure. Yes. And I loved that, but that no longer worked. And I had to really have a gut check moment and say, what works for my family? Yeah. You know, what works for long term? Because I don't know what we're looking at. Like, I don't know. Yeah. You know, I, I went to the same place every day <laughs> and saw the same people every day. And I drank the same coffee every day and like, it wasn't that bad. Yeah. You know? And what did you discover that you love about development? Like, tell me a little bit about what's different about development. Cause I really don't know. Yeah, sure. So as a producer, I'm being hired to 
carry out a show that's already been sold. So the the actual filming of it, the you know, the pre-production and the production is what I what I did forever. Uh, in development, I'm trying to sell the idea. I'm trying to create the idea or find the talent or get the sh- the show sold so that some other person can now go yeah. produce it. Yeah. And I just loved I loved putting all the pieces together. You know, I loved finding a nugget of an idea and seeing is that a show mm. or reading a magazine and seeing a couple and being like, Oh my God, they're so like, that's a show, whatever they're doing. That's so cool. You yeah. know? And, and that sort of freedom of creativity was, um, it, it was, yeah, it was a game changer. And I'm guessing that that must have fed you on a level that you so deeply needed in that moment in your life. It did. I loved going to work. I bet it was probably like a break. It was a chance to flex those muscles, you know, and, and being able to still do my job, to know that I could still do my job in the midst of all of this craziness, you know, was very empowering. And not to say that I didn't have my moments, because I certainly did and still do, you know, I still do. I still, something will hit me at work and I have to like take a minute and just kind of acknowledge we've been through a lot, yeah. you know? And um, yeah, I know I love, I love going to work. Yeah. Do you right now in my life, I've just recently divorced and I am, I've really amped up my self care like massively. Like it's almost just been like, like I was joking. I, I said this on the last couple podcasts I've been joking about how I bought a biomat. Do you know what a biomat is? Okay. Well, if you go on any like biohackers, you know, Instagram or websites, it's a, it's, it's amazing. And I at first wasn't sure about it, but now I'm a believer because it's basically a giant heating pad that gives infrared um, heat and it's lined with amethyst crystals. And it's basically, you're getting like a healing treatment every time you use it not to go off on too much of a tangent. However, it was like my gift to myself after this big life event and transition that I went through. Part of the self-care of that is like, you know, I've been through this thing and I'm an older, you know, middle-aged woman, I guess. Am I middle-aged? I don't even know what's middle-aged anymore. But So hot. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm 43. And, you know, I just need more self-care. Do you... Ha- even have time for that because you've got I make time. Okay, good. So let, tell me I'm about that. I'm not a martyr. <laughs> okay, tell me what you do for yourself. How do you, and how do you fit it in? Um cuz you're busy and you just finished telling me before we hit record that you're commuting to work and in LA that is no small feat. Yeah. I just decided that I was going to fit it in because I didn't have a choice. When you are a caregiver and in addition to the other things wife, mom, employee, whatever. Yeah. But when you are a caregiver, that stamina is so important. And I knew that if I didn't take care of myself, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to do all the things that I need to do. Yeah. So I'm, I don't like it when women say, I just, I'd love to take care of myself, but I just, I just can't. I just can't. I don't have the time. No, you do, but you have not given yourself the freedom to make yourself a priority. Yes. And I just, for whatever reason, some would probably say it's because I'm, I was raised as an only child. I, Me too. I have no problem making yeah. myself a priority. Yeah. I do soul cycle. Um, I started doing acupuncture. Oh, love acupuncture. What John and I both did. And, um, it changed. It's a game changer. Game isn't changer. It? Game changer. Yeah. And I will like shout it from the rooftops now to anyone. I'm like, it's so incredible. So um, I did those things. And then my friends are my lifeline. So I really just made time for them. And and I was very vocal about needing them. And the other thing that I did was. I told people what I needed. Hmm. 
Was that something that you had done before or did this amp it up in a way? No, no. You know, you don't, you don't realize until you're in it. Right. Like, and then I realized like, Oh God, I've been like such a horrible friend (laughs) to so many people because, because people say, Oh, just what can I, is there anything I can do? And I wanted to be like, yeah, don't make me find a job for you. Like if you want to help, then think of something, just do it. And so I tried to take the guesswork out for people. Just for our listeners yeah. who might have a friend that's going through this. Mm-hmm. For example, what would you wish that for a friend to come a volunteer for? A couple of things. I think it depends on the person. Right. Right. But I think give a gift certificate to dry bar or massage or your nails and then say, I'm coming to watch the kids yes. while you go do this. Yes. And don't just, it's not a choice. Like yeah. you, you need this. Your yeah. friend needs this. So yeah. do that for them. Yeah. Make a meal, drop it off. Yeah. So make a big production about it. Yeah. Just do it, you know? And I always wanted to give, I wanted people to give me the freedom to not feel obligated to call them back or text them back. Yes. So there's a really simple thing that I think you can do. I realize now that people are so afraid of saying the wrong thing that sometimes they don't say anything. You know, I was confused by why I didn't hear from some people. And for a while I was like, that's so weird. Like I thought, thought we were friends. I thought we were close. And then I sort of realized along the way that people just, they don't know what to say. They're afraid you're so busy that. So I say now, reach out. Don't worry about saying the wrong thing. The only thing you have to say is, I just want you to know I'm thinking of you. And, and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Because that means a lot. It does. Because you really do, at least for me, I needed the, the support. I needed the boosting. Yeah. Because it's heavy. And you have two little ones. You have to keep going and keep smiling for them and keep, you know, I mean, not that you're inauthentic and smiling, but no, yeah. Every day can't be doom and gloom. My other release was the blog. Yes. Oh, let's talk about that. I want to hear about the blog. (laughs) So the blog I started. um, What's the name of the blog? It's called Mommy Dearest Inc. And I know that there's a generation of people who don't know the movie Mommy Dearest, but for those that do sort of get the joke that uh, no more wire hangers like we. So my two friends, Susan and Teresa, who also, you know, and went to the same preschool. Yes. We would have these conversations about all of these mom accounts and, you know, these Pinterest moms and seeing on Instagram, like all this white furniture and these beautiful children. And like, it was the complete opposite experience that we were having. I mean, it was. I'm laughing because I, oh, I relate so much and I love what you guys have done. And also I always used to make this joke of like, God, am I the only mom that's not making furniture out of reclaimed wood and selling it on Etsy? Like this is, I'm just not in this crowd. And, and, and it's such a, it's such a big market, right? Like, and it, and I felt like it was everywhere. Yeah. Everything I saw was beautiful motherhood. And I didn't have that. I wasn't having that experience. And we would have this text chain that was basically like, well, this is what's really going on. Mm -hmm. And I'm not crazy. Am I like, you're experiencing this too. And once we sort of realized that we could put humor into the honesty of parenting. That's where it was born from. And just, it it was so selfish because we wanted the outlet for ourselves. And it was a big, also a big part of getting through the times because I was still laughing. We were still laughing and I was still able to, you know, make a meme about, my kids being assholes (laughs) and like that felt freeing. Yes. So tell me where you guys are at with the project now. It's been going for a couple years. You have an Instagram account, which we'll provide a link to. So what I really, cause I, I I love writing and I've always fancied myself a writer. Um, but it's hard to, a blog is so much and it's not just the writing. I mean, I don't know. I, I, 
I don't, I didn't really have any preconceived notions about it, but I didn't realize all of the crap that goes into actually getting your blog seen. Yeah. So the blog itself is still around, but it's just hard to spend that time to like write the essay and then find the pictures and do the SEO and the algorithms and the, and the and like who has the yeah. time. I just want to write. I just yeah. want to create. Yeah. Um, so Instagram actually is, is my favorite part of it because I love making memes. Like I, I don't, it's like such a weird sign of our time. It is. Like yeah. I'm a meme maker. <laughs> what the fuck does that mean? That's not a thing. It sure is. But it is, <laughs> but it is. And so, I, and I feel like I have learned so much about the state of motherhood through doing this. How so? Every meme is an experiment. It's like a little research project. And so I test and we test what will our audience respond to? What do they find funny? What do they find relatable? What are they struggling with? And my favorite thing in the world, because I rely on gratification, (laughs) I need it at all times. Um, my favorite thing is making a meme and then having people comment and tag their friends and be like, oh, we were just talking about this or, oh my God, I thought we were the only ones. Yeah. Cause you know, you hit a nerve in a good know, way, in a good way yeah. in the bet. And that's the whole reason to do it yeah. is just to say like this modern parenting is bullshit. Yeah. It's so yeah. hard. And it's not this picture you're getting of the Etsy white and the shabby chic couch. And it's, it's not that. Yeah, and, yeah. The, and there are mothers who can pull that off. And like, I take nothing away from them. Yes. But it's not but, our truth. Yeah. And I want to make sure that there's space in the conversation about motherhood to still be able to say the other yes. truth. I'm right? remembering my friend Tanya who was on episode two. Yes, I heard. Yes. And she was telling me one time, I was calling her, her daughter's older than I am. I was calling her crying. I think my son was two and a half, hysterical crying to and from our preschool, which was for me a commute as well. I'm like, I don't know. I'm just doing it all wrong. It's just wrong. I'm not, he's not, he doesn't have reclaimed wood furniture. Or that. <laughs> and she's like, honey, most days I'm just deciding, do I wipe this booger on my pant leg or do I flick it out the window? <laughs> And it made me feel so much better. Oh my God. There's nothing better than lowering your expectations. There's nothing better in motherhood than just being like, I don't give a fuck anymore. Yeah. I know I'm allowed to cuss on this podcast, which made me so excited because I can't stop. Yeah. (laughs) Because it feels good. I have a real issue with that. Yeah. I even curse when I write. But anyway, yeah. So it's it's been uh, so gratifying. And where are you guys now with the project? Are you just, you still have the, the Instagram feed yeah. going strong? Focusing on Instagram right now and really, you know, building that audience and then just trying to figure out what, what the next stage is. Yeah. Have you guys thought about doing content like yeah. either, either a podcast or a video cast? I mean, you're so physically oh my beautiful. God, you have such I know, a crush but on me. I, I kind of do. It. I kind of do. I can't help it. <laughs> um, we did so so we did venture into video territory we and did. it's so much fun and I love it and I would love to do more of it. I need cuz that's my day job, right? So like I can't also come home and do all the totally. producing. So I need oh God, a yeah. team. Yeah. that will do that. I just am like waiting for somebody to be like, "Hey, I want to spend some money and make some videos with you guys. And then, well, it would be someone like you at a development company (laughs) that looks at your Instagram and says, wait a minute. And now there's so much content waiting. There's so much, it's going to happen. I mean, if you guys want it to, because I, I would watch that. Thanks for sure. I would subscribe to people who, people who work with me know that I am always desperately trying to get on camera. Don't doubt that. Desperate. That's really cute. And I always hear that I want it too bad, and that's why it doesn't happen. Or just the timing isn't right. Yeah, sure. (laughs) Clock's ticking, though. (laughs) No way. No way. We ripen with age. No, well. Aside from all this that you have going on, is there anything else that you're really excited about that you want to share? 
dismantling the patriarchy. Oh God, <laughs> that we could spend another hour on that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, it's hard living right now with this. I just wrote actually for another site, I wrote a satire piece about The Handmaid's Tale. Oh, <gasps> Where can we find that? Um, that is on this amazing site called Mock Mom. Okay. Which is all, I've done a few pieces for them. It's all satire, motherhood, like hysterical, hysterical stuff. And this was basically like the purpose of the piece was where to find your Handmaid's Tale uniform, a modern girl shopping guide for your Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> I love it. And for me, satire and writing and using humor to sort of get through this stage of being a woman in um, is so helpful because I just get real angry yeah, and want to do anything I can to lend a voice to women and the causes that women believe in and the fight of equal pay and maternity leave and all of these things I've just become so passionate about. Yeah. And so I'm trying to find little ways of fitting that into the puzzle. You yeah. Know? I love that. Well, I can't wait to read that article. You know, you're doing it just by being all the things that you've talked about on this podcast, you know, being a mom and a wife and doing your job and having this Instagram and doing your self-care and, and coming and doing my podcast today. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Well, you're welcome. I mean, you're amazing. So it's time. Is it really? For our questions. I know it goes, it does go really fast when you're having so much fun. Three questions and then lightning round. You get three questions and then lightning round. Yes. What do you think about when you hear the word MILF? Oh, you. Other than me. <laughs> You are now synonymous with MILF in my mind. What's something you've changed your mind about recently? Boils down to, I have changed my mind about being okay with being uncomfortable. Because this has been a struggle for me, and, and I don't think I've realized it was a struggle. I think I always sort of looked at if there was a challenge in front of me or if there was a problem in front of me that I needed to immediately solve it. Mm. and what I'm sort of releasing now, what I've changed my mind about a bit is that sometimes I just have to sit in uncertainty or being uncomfortable, being out of my comfort zone, not knowing if I'm going to be good at something mm. and trying it anyway. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, that sort of plays into a few different categories in life, but that is, I'm, I've changed my mind about being uncomfortable. Mm. Good one. How do you define success? So, well, I really wanted to be like, you know, just you feel like you've created good work and your family is healthy and happy, but it's not true. <laughs> I'm, as I said, need gratification at all times. So, and I, and I think it's because my, I was always praised. I was always praised as a child. Yeah. And so I, I, if you're not telling me that I'm, my boss knows this now, we laugh about it all the time. If you're not telling me I'm doing a good job, like I can't, <laughs> I can't. It's so hard for me. <laughs> so, um, success for me is validation. Mm. You know, like I want to win an Emmy. Mm -hmm. I would feel successful if that happened. Yeah. I want um, to write a book. I want to see my name on the cover of a book. That would be success for me. Yeah. I want those tangible things are important to me. And um, I, I can't apologize for it. Like, yeah, I nor don't, should you. Yeah. Nor should you. And I think there's something alongside that is you know, you, you named it validation and those are beautiful achievements right. associated with what you are talking about, which is putting your voice into the world right? and making a statement about the things that are important to you. So I think that's beautiful. Yeah. I think though, as you know, women, we're, we're conditioned to not have those things that it's not necessarily okay to have those things as goals. Mm, how so you know? what do you mean because then you're just you're 
you're too competitive mm. or you're, you're power hungry or you're, you're only focused on yourself. Like men don't have those same sort of It's so true. Feedback. Yeah. The creator of the show that your husband worked on Mm -hmm. has a reputation of that. And she is one of the most successful, amazing women in television and has been. And people call her a bitch behind her back all the time. All the time. You know, I was thinking about it and thinking about how I wanted to answer it because I, you know, you don't ever want to seem like, oh, I'm just. I joke about being desperate for validation, but like, I think women need to be okay to say, I want to be the best. Yes. And it doesn't mean that we're going to trample on other people to get there. Right. But it's okay to want the ring. Absolutely. Men men have wanted and gotten the ring forever. Like, why can't we, you know? And we are. Yeah. It's happening. Lightning round. Oh God. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Ready. Ocean or desert? Ocean. Favorite junk food? Doritos. Movies or Broadway show? Broadway musical, but not play. Excellent. Daytime sex or nighttime sex? Daytime. Texting or talking? Texting. Please don't ever call me. Cat person or dog person? I really, I like them both and hate them both equally. Mm. Have you ever worn a unitard? Yes. Shower or bathtub? Shower. Only because I don't have a proper bathtub if I had I want a clawfoot tub so badly oh yeah that would be success for me yeah clawfoot tub my girlfriend was just telling me about a slipper tub do you know what those are I didn't know the name of it but it's like a clawfoot tub it can be clawfoot or or flat but it's got a higher back Mm. so you can lean back I don't know I'm leaning back that's my new that's my new version of success (laughs) the slipper tub the slipper tub I mean yes I'm with you mine's a house in Malibu yeah. There you go. <laughs> Just, I want to live by the beach. Um, ice cream or chocolate? Chocolate. On a scale of one to 10, how good are you at roasting a chicken? <laughs> well, I'm real good at buying the roast chicken and pretending that I made it. So 10. ten. What's your biggest pet peeve? I don't like it when people whistle behind me. Oh, yeah, that's weird. What do you mean whistle like a cat call or just whistle like no, just whistling to themselves? Yeah, just any general. whistling. I also don't like it when people are late. Mm, me too. And I, when I'm late, I have major anxiety. Oh, major anxiety. I can't even feel. Mm-hmm. If you could push a button mm-hmm. and it would create 10 years of world peace, but mm-hmm. it would also place a 100-year ban on all beauty products, <laughs> would you push it? Well, you know, I've just started... Do you know I just yes. started doing Beauty Counter? Oh yes. my God, you personalized this one to me. Okay, read it again. If you could push a button and it would create 10 years of world peace, but it would also place a 100-year ban on all beauty products, would you push it? It's only 10 years of world peace. So you know we're going to fuck it up. And th- so well, I'm, going, I'm literally going through all the scenarios of what does 10 years of world peace look like and then what happens afterwards. God, I feel like I have to say yes to this or I'll sound like such an asshole. (laughs) Yes, Jen, of course I would push it. (laughs) Nothing is more important than world world peace, peace. especially not lipstick. Superpower choice, invisibility or ability to fly? Invisibility. Would you rather have six fingers on both hands or a belly button that looks like foreskin? (laughs) I had to change it up for you because I know you've been listening to me. So good. Six fingers. What was the name of your first pet? Tigger. What was the name of the street you grew up on? Cherry Tree. I know. It's it's so good. So good. So good. Tigger Cherry Tree. Yeah. You're amazing. Thank you. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Are you still doing your pole dancing? Yes, I am. Tell us about it because I want to do it. Oh my gosh. You have to come. Where do you go? Anytime. I'll come. I'll set up a private for just the two of us. Um, I go to Sheila Kelly's S Factor on okay. La Brea and Wilshire. Okay. And I go about twice a week. Yeah. And it changed my life five years ago. Really. I remember when you started doing it. Yes. And I, I want to try it. I yes. so badly want to try it. Let's do it. And if okay. you have other girlfriends that want to come, we'll make yeah. a night of it. It's really fun. Oh, good. And it's so empowering. And it's yeah. um, it's really safe because it's in a dark room with all all women, obviously. A dark room, dimly lit with no mirrors. Amazing. And it's not about look at my hot body. It's about feeling my hot body. 
yeah. and just knowing and that each of us have a hot body, right. you know, in all shapes and sizes, you know, and I've yeah. watched women dance all ages, all shapes, all, you know, and they're just all so sexy. It's just That's unbelievable amazing. because they're in themselves and it's right. beautiful. Because it's only about them. It's, only it's not about, about anybody them. else. It's not about them pleasing. It's not right. about a male gaze. A ma- yeah, totally. It's really I love it. fun. I'm so excited to try it. Yes. Yay. We'll make a date. Okay. And if people want to find your beauty counter and- Oh God, you can find me in so many places. Okay. So Instagram for the blog is Mommy Dearest Inc. Beauty counter is beautycounter.com slash Ellie Hoover Greenway. Great. And what about any personal Instagram? That's just me posting pictures of my kids. Who gives a shit? <laughs> I give a shit, Kelly. <laughs> I do. Do you know what I did? Do I have 30 seconds? Yeah, to we have many seconds. So um, this weekend, one of my friends was over and noticed this picture of John and I from our honeymoon. And she was like, oh my God, you guys look like babies. And I'm like, yes, but it's not just that, right? Like, it's just the before kids before life wears you down, before you're like so annoyed with each other that you can't stand <laughs> be in the same room. Not that that happens to John and I. Um, and so I posted on my Instagram, I posted this picture and like did this funny thing where I was like missing. This couple hasn't been seen <laughs> since they gave birth to two children who don't like to sleep past 6 a.m. But people thought it was like a, a, a couple that was missing. <laughs> And I was like, no, 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 no. I just want to go back to Italy. Like, I don't recognize that couple anymore. That's all. So, yeah. So that's my personal Instagram where I do shit like that. Why wouldn't we want to follow that? (laughs) We'll see. Maybe we'll put it up there anyway, just because you're so fabulous. Oh, thank you. Incredibly beautiful. And thank you so much for today. Jen and I are going to make out after this. (laughs) Yeah. Turning the recorder off to have some (laughs) private time. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening, guys. I really hope you enjoyed my conversation with Kelly. I know I did. Next week on the show, we have Dr. Suzanne Gilberg-Lenz. Suzanne is brilliant. She's amazing. She's been my doctor for, I think, 18 years, something incredible like that. And um, I'm so grateful to have her as my physician. And then to have her on the show was just really cool to have her come over to my house, you know, was like really cool. And we just talked about all the cool stuff she's doing outside of having raised two kids, that she's really involved in women's health and supporting women's health and empowering women and educating women. So tune in. And also, please pop over to the website and sign up for our newsletter because I'm going to be doing some giveaways. I just ordered a big shipment of merch, of MILF podcast merch. I'm going to leave it a surprise as to what it is because I'm so excited. But when it comes, I will, I'll do some photo shoots of it and post it for you guys to see. So, but I'm going to be doing giveaways with that uh, weekly because I want you guys to get cool stuff. Because you should, because you're listening to my podcast and I'm grateful to you for it. So tune in next week. Thanks so much for listening, guys. Bye.